Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome back, I hope, I mean, for the first time, but many uh, returning uh, to part 17 of our series now as Libraries in Response. Uh, we began in late March with this question of what is a library if the building is closed? Uh, that, of course, has evolved as uh, libraries have responded in different ways. Uh, and today we're taking that same concept and looking at it through the lens of schools. One of the things we're talking about today, anyway. And that question in the context of schools is much more daunting and complex. I mean, if the library's closed, it's just closed. And all the people, which is a lot of people that, that depend on the library, more or less do what they would otherwise be doing if they weren't at the library. Uh, for schools, it, that just doesn't work because if children are not at school, where are they? They're with an adult, presumably somewhere, and what's that adult doing other than taking care of the child? And so the, the and that leaves aside, you know, the, the, the value of school itself. It's just the logistics, the social logistics of, of in the U.S., some 50 million children uh, more or less locked out. Uh, it's starting to open. We're going to talk about it. Uh, we are hosted today, as we are each Friday, by oh. IFLA, the International Federation of Library Associations and Institutions. Uh, our media co-host is Broadband Breakfast. They've been giving us good publicity on this. So, um, there we go. Um, so our topic of the day is, is school, which is imminent. It's amazing that uh, we're right upon opening of school and now it seems everyone is suddenly paying attention to it. And as though this weren't an obvious question in April, uh, how we were gonna do it. There was no evidence through the entire spring that there was a reasonable way to do it with any kind of level of uh, infection happening around. And that certainly has not changed, just to the contrary. We're also gonna hear uh, from uh, the United Kingdom uh, Isabella Hunter, the Chief Executive of Libraries Connected, uh, which is formerly known as the Society of Chief Librarians, uh, was going to give us an update on, you know, the happenings there, uh, how libraries are opening or planning to open or, you know, the various aspects that we've talked about, internet access, digital services, physical materials, and, and social infrastructure, we hope. Uh, our, we'll also hear from Castleberry uh, School District in Fort Worth from Heather Lamb, uh, the head librarian for the district, and also from Jacob Bowser, who's the director of technology operations. Really interesting story there. It both uh, talks about the role of libraries for schools, even as a school librarian, is a question we've been asking for a long time mostly from the standpoint of public libraries. What can public libraries do to support schools and students and families trying to cope with this, uh, this environment? And, um, uh, uh, and Jacob is, has initiated and is overseeing an extraordinary uh, wide area wireless system that uses uh, citizens band radio spectrum, which we've talked about in the past, CBRS. Uh, a system they already had in place when this hit, which has proven to be uh, prescient and, and extremely valuable. So back to the, well, let's not call it good news because it's not. Um, I try not to be a downer with these. I'm not gonna uh, uh, subject you to a graph of the skyrocketing caseload in the US, but at the same time, this is the controlling phenomena. Uh, that we're uh, this creating a context for us. We have never seen a change in civilization happen so quickly as this virus has caused. Uh, but at least in the U.S., we are remaining number one. The exceptionalism of the U.S. remains unchallenged. And uh, as a matter of fact, we haven't even really given up our, not only our lead, but our proportion of the lead. Uh, 
So we're still holding it around 25% of all the cases and deaths in the country due to the, due to the uh, disease. Um, in spite of the fact that, you know, we only have about 4% of the world's population. So what, what is that if not exceptional? Um, yet, uh, we have hope for a vaccine to get us out of this. My point in subjecting you to this is to think long term, that this is not going to go away soon. This is not going to be over at the end of the year or in the spring. This is going to be with us for a long time. In this statistic uh, out of Science Magazine just last month uh, helps put that in perspective, that 50%, even getting through all the logistics of actually creating a vaccine that works and having it distributed, having people take it, the people that are willing to take it, it still won't accomplish the immunity that, that we need to have with enough people. This 50% is not enough people to create uh, a control over the, and suppress the, the, the virus. So it kind of begs the question, <laughs> rarely asked, is our children learning? To segue into our topic today, uh, this is uh, a notable quote. Uh, and so, well, yes, uh, yes, we are learning. This, this image uh, from Juno, the spacecraft, a half a billion miles out, uh, taking a, a, a high resolution image of the south pole of Jupiter, extraordinary image. And it represents a phenomenal amount of science and engineering and a lot of other disciplines to make this happen. So, yes, we do have capability. And yes, some of us are learning, but maybe not all of us are learning. Uh, this, is, this is a kind of a baseline for expectations for what people can believe and not believe. And it's just daunting. This is about five years old. Uh, uh, it was a just after release of a, one of the Jurassic Park movies, and they asked this question of people, you know, do you believe they, the people and dinosaurs exist at the same time? And you can see that, you know, <laughs> for me, everybody that's not in the definitely not category is in the same category. You know, they skipped that day at school or something is wrong here uh, about what people know, can learn, and are willing to believe. So. It's not that optimistic, but I don't want to, you know, get expectations too high on what, what's ahead of us. So the point of this is to think not only about what you're doing today and tomorrow, but the long term. So let's do find out what, uh, what our children is learning and go to our presenters. Uh, excuse me, let me stop this. Stop share. Okay. Uh, first, we're going to go across the Atlantic and uh, hear from Isabel, who is like Stephen, uh, on vacation in Germany, taking time from their late afternoons to join us here. We try to start these a little bit early so we can overlap with a number of time zones in Europe and Africa, where we've also had presenters. So, Isabel, uh, welcome. Uh, thank you for making the time. And please tell us what's what's happening uh, in Britain. Hey, thanks for thanks for inviting me. It's um, four o'clock on a Friday here in London, so good good uh, good time for me as I come to the end of the week. Um, so we, yeah, the situation in the UK with COVID has been um, very difficult. Um, we are in fact third in the world for the highest number of death rates per million. So, you know, it depends what measure you use, but, um, you know, in some ways we've, we've done worse than the United States at the moment. Um, so, uh, sorry, I should introduce who we are. So, um, Libraries Connected, we're the membership body for public libraries in, um, in the UK, apart from Scotland. Scotland has a, a separate body that, that we do a lot of work with. So we cover England, Wales, Northern Ireland, um, and also the islands, that, the small islands that sit around the UK. So we cover about 177 separate library services. So in the UK, libraries are um, the responsibility of local authorities. So although they're, we think of them as a national network, they're in fact very locally based and most of their funding comes from the local authority as well. There's obviously been um, very challenging times over the last decade. 
but libraries are still very much alive and well and I think a really strong and um, revived force in our country. So we've still got over 3,000 branches. Um, we had um, 177 million book loans last year. So it's still very, very important and vibrant, um, you know, and increasingly, again, I think like libraries in the States, increasingly they've taken on that role of um, community infrastructure. Um, we had a really good session with Eric Klinenberg recently. He came and uh, talked with um, library people in the UK. And I think his, his discussion about um, social infrastructure, he really, really gets what, what libraries do and you know, very much explained the role of, of libraries in the UK. Um, so we went into full lockdown on the 23rd of March. There'd been a sort of um, phased approach by the UK government. So libraries were one of the last types of services or business to close down. Um, so we went into full lockdown then um, and um, what happened then was that library staff took a breath and then immediately turned to developing digital and remote offers. So we supported them to do that and we branded it as libraries from home um, and did quite a lot of work on social media to advertise that. But of course libraries were also pushing it very hard to their usual members and users. So that included um, ebook lending. I can say more about that and the challenges um, around that and around e-licensing. Um, we've got some quite difficult challenges in the UK around that. Um, but we saw an enormous surge of interest. So in the first couple of weeks, there was something like six times as many people signing up to become e-members as, as usual. And that was really exciting. So it was existing library users, but also a lot of, a lot of new people who've never used a library before. And loans um, went up. Um, um, and, and have stayed high throughout the whole period. Um, another element from Libraries from Home was um, librarians doing one of their core roles, which is selecting high quality materials that meet their users' needs. So there was loads of stuff out there. Every single cultural body, every organisation was, was advertising, look at this amazing online thing, we've got this view, we've got that view. Quite frankly, it was quite bewildering. So uh, libraries did a really good job to slim that down and select stuff that would suit families and kids, older people, keeping active, you know, some of those sort of core thematic or user groups, um, the, the kind of way that they normally select and package good quality materials. But something quite exciting also happened that libraries, um, in a way, took a whole decade's worth of development in one big leap overnight. So they looked at how can we move some of our well-loved daily events? How can we move those online? What can we do? So there was a whole surge of um, experimenting with filming um, things like rhyme time, story time, Lego clubs, reading book groups, all those kind of daily, everyday activities that people coming to libraries, um, putting those online, um, having them as either live events um, through platforms like Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, or, or as filmed events. And the response to this was incredible. I, I thought, oh yeah, it'll get maybe, you know, 40 people looking at their own time. Um, but one of the libraries that was early um, to adopt this, they had in the first or second week, they had something like 10,000 people watching one of their story times. So, you know, that was people from all over the country. And it was really interesting because it wasn't a sophisticated production it was you know a lady sitting in a chair reading a story being filmed with a you know phone or laptop but I think what the public were responding to was something it was it was very familiar um, that the reading was good quality good quality books so again it's that sort of special quality that that library brings parents knew that this would be a, a good um, activity for their children so, um, you know, libraries across the country have been, have been doing that with great, you know, really, really good um, user statistics there, very interesting. So it's something that we, um, you know, they all want to sustain um, as we go forward as, as another way of, of reaching people who maybe can't, can't come into the library at, um, for those events normally. Um, Libraries also made a big effort to keep in touch with people. So, you know, lending books or um, welcoming people into story time is one thing. But what about all the people, all the digitally excluded people, um, especially older people who, you know, who were, who were told to stay at home and, and shield themselves? So many libraries um, uh, did a massive effort to phone older residents 
So there was one library service in, in um, the north of England, for example, and they, they had a list of um, something like 70,000 people in their area um, over a certain age. So they, they committed to phone every single one of those people. And those kind of keep in touch calls are kind of common feature. So, um, you know, it's keeping in touch. Hi, how are you doing? It's, you know, Isabel from the library. So partly it was about a nice social chat, but also those library staff were trained to look, um, you know, have you got any needs? Can we help you get online? Have you got your medicine? Have you got someone to bring you food? Um, so in many cases, they were then referring that person on to um, other um, support services to help them, you know, and in some cases making a really important difference to, to people surviving lockdown. Um, and certainly that kind of emotional or mental well-being. Um, my my um, mum is in her 80s and, and she was so pleased to have a, a weekly call from her local library lady. It really made such a difference to her, just this nice, this very simple thing of a nice friendly chat from, from you know, from her library service that she's very fond of. Um, in many library services, um, because they're part, most libraries in the UK are still part of the local authority, so in many cases staff were completely redeployed away from library work but into other emergency um, work that the council needed to do. Um, and I think library staff were really prized because of their skills of working with people, knowing com their community, um, solving problems, thinking on their feet, um, you know, all those, all those skills that in every day on the library floor people need to bring into play. Again, those were really, really um, like gold dust during the crisis. So we saw staff redeployed into community um, phone helplines, um, food parcel distribution, working with volunteers. We even had some staff working in quite difficult places like crematoria or morgues. Um, or, or, or gardening and supporting in um, old people's homes. So a whole range, range of activities that people um, were redeployed into. And I think it's great tribute to library staff that they, you know, they, they, they willingly did this and, and were keen to help. You know, they didn't sort of say, it's not my job, I'm not doing it. You know, we've got so many stories of people wanting to use their skills to help their communities, really moving stuff. We also had some libraries using their um, resources in different ways. So, uh, um, for example, one library service in the north of England um, used its 3D printers and was making hundreds and hundreds of face visors, which it delivered to local uh, GP surgeries um, and to old people's homes. And a lovely story when they took one um, delivery to an old people's home, all the, all the staff had turned out in the car park to applaud the driver. Because at that stage, um, old people's homes were finding it very, very difficult to get hold of face coverings and, and visors. So this supply from the library was, you know, literally life-saving for, for residents and staff. Um, so now we've moved on from full lockdown and we're in the, um, frankly, slightly confusing situation of easing lockdown and, and unlocking. So libraries were allowed to reopen from the 6th of July. Um, so we did a lot of work with libraries in um, the, the months and weeks before that. Um, we did a lot of work to plan what reopening would look like. And we developed a service recovery toolkit, which was then adopted by the government as their um, sort of official advice for libraries. So we did a lot of learning there. It was very useful to see what was happening in uh, libraries in the States, Australia, across Europe. So we stole all the uh, good ideas we could, quite shamefully. Um, and we set out a, a recovery pathway for libraries. That, again, I think it's probably very familiar to the way that, that you may have approached in your library services. So looking at which are the safer services to restore first. So um, order and collect, where you just come in, pick up your pack of books and go as quickly as possible home library service, uh, delivering books into school. Uh, that's for most libraries, that's the first stage. And then the second stage is cautiously opening the doors, letting people in for very controlled um, visits uh, for browsing, book collection, um, and to use uh, library computers. So we've got some libraries in, in that first phase. Some have moved on to the second one. We've got some libraries that are still uh, waiting to get permission that from their local authority to open. But we've also got a situation now where, because we've finally got um, testing, community testing in place, means that local authorities are able to pinpoint when there were local surges 
Um, and this week, unfortunately, we're in a, a period where the rates seem to be rising again. So the government is imposing some more lockdown uh, restrictions, and some of these are very localised. So the next thing we want to work, work with libraries on is how do you um, respond to a local lockdown? How do you sort of uh, reduce your services to a safe, safe level for a period? How do you know when it's safe to expand and develop them again? Um, we've also had some quite confusing advice from the government around face coverings. So um, there was um, instruction uh, about a week ago that everyone has to wear face covering on transport and in a lot of um, enclosed spaces as of shops and banks, but not in libraries. Uh, but fortunately today that advice has been revised and um, now libraries, museums and, and similar places, we also, people also have to wear masks. So in this country, um, people are, are generally quite compliant with that. I know in, in some parts of the States, people have been quite resistant to wearing masks, but it's not, not really, um, you know, in, in England, people might grumble about it, but they'll still put a mask on. They won't, they, they don't see it as a big restriction of their liberty in general. Um, another thing that libraries have to do under um, request from the government is um, be part of the um, tracing um, system. So if somebody comes into the library for browsing or to use IT, then libraries have to take down their uh, name and contact details in case there's a, a, an outbreak and they then have to be asked to isolate. Again, there was a bit, a bit of anxiety about how that would, um, you know, managing personal data. Um, but I think in practice, um, again, most, most library users are quite happy to give their names. And the system has been developed by the government and its information commissioner's office. So it is legally compliant and it hasn't proved to be such a big challenge um, as we thought. So then we're now at this crossroads. We're still sort of kind of in lockdown, but we're looking to the future. So I think some of the, the big challenges ahead shouldn't be underestimated. Um, so the first one I think is how do we continue to recover our services? Nobody wants to stay at this partial state where there's, you know, book lending and a bit of IT and not much else. You know, it's very frustrating to see that communities really need all those full services that libraries can deliver around tackling isolation, connecting communities, rebuilding economies, all that work we can't fully do at the moment. So I know that um, we'll, we'll continue to find ways to work around that and I'm sure that new ways of working will start to emerge over the next few weeks, maybe more work outside the library or different ways of managing to restore services in, in safe manner inside the buildings. So I think this whole series of thinking that you've been doing about what's a library without a building, you know, it's really, really timely and I'm gonna make sure I'm gonna watch um, lots of the um, sessions online so I can, um, again, steal some useful ideas for the UK. Um, another thing that, that is, is we shouldn't underestimate, um, because the pandemic's been so expensive, local authorities have got absolutely no money left at all. Um, so funding for local authorities will be really, really tight. So I think, you know, we've got a, an enormous job ahead to make sure that the value of libraries is fully understood so that we, um, there will have to be some cuts, there will be some closures, but we hope those will be proportionate. Um, so I think a lot of advocacy work to make sure that the, the role of libraries in community recovery and their potential is really, really understood. Um, so we're just finishing a piece of research to try and get some evidence and data behind that. It really shows, you know, all the work we did in lockdown and what that means for the potential of the work we can do as communities recover. Um, another area that the um, lockdowns brought into sharp relief is, is of course, digital inclusion. That I, I, Again, really, really interested to hear uh, about the, um, the, the work um, in, in Texas with the schools. Um, you know, and the, the, the situation in the UK, similar as other parts of the world, there's, you know, enormous lumps of the population who are digitally excluded. So I think what, what I'm very interested to look at is uh, what sort of large scale intervention or, or development can libraries support. So in the UK at the moment, all libraries are part of what's called the People's Network. So they all have um, internet connectivity, PCs, um, and they all have free Wi-Fi. But what's the next step? How can we look at taking that uh, digital connectivity outside into communities and really, you know, expanding our role as that, that community um, place of connection, that sort of people's network plus that, you know, communities so badly need for the future if they're going to survive and, and thrive. 
And then the, the fourth big challenge we've got to, to really tackle, which again, the pandemic through the lockdown through into sharp relief, is around e-licensing. So we've got a, a pretty poor situation in the UK. So there's no legislation to support libraries around e-licensing. So publishers can choose whether or not to license content to libraries. Um, and they can choose what, what terms they license them to. So we have some major publishers who um, don't, don't provide any e-licensed content to libraries at all. So that's many of the bestsellers and the most popular books completely off the list. Um, and then the other ones that the costing is completely out of step with the cost of hard copy books. Um, so although we, we were able to secure um, a small amount of funding for libraries during lockdown to help them buy ebooks of a thousand pounds per library service that averages out at about 20, 20 titles you know it's a drop in the ocean so if we're really going to respond to this public demand for e-borrowing alongside hard copy borrowing then you know some concerted effort is needed and, and some work with publishers to develop a more um, a more sensible licensing regime that will benefit libraries, readers, and also benefit the publishing industry. You know, where we are at the moment just, uh, just isn't going to work for the future. Um, yeah, so I think those are, uh, those are sort of four of our major challenges as we're standing here at this sort of cross, uneasy crossroads between lockdown and post-lockdown, uh, but still, you know, very much, um, very much with, the, with the, um, the virus still, still all around us. Wow. Well, uh, you've done a lot. And, and as you say, the challenges remain. Uh, that's, that's unhappy news that the publishers are being unhelpful, shall we say, at best in this. Uh, but you know, this is, of course, not new. Uh, this was a conversation 100 years ago. Yeah. You know, why would anybody ever buy a book if they could get it for free at the library? Absolutely. But, yeah. Well, I, I think part of the response is that 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 helped create a nation of readers who wanted their own books and exactly. libraries have played this role of kind of, you know, demo site mm -hmm. for all kinds of uh, commercial services and products. Uh, but, you know, they're limited, uh, of course, mm -hmm. in, in certain ways. And then uh, people want their own. They, a lot of people had their first experience of broadband at a, at a library and said, mm -hmm. Oh, I've been doing all this dial up. I never understood what they were talking about. Now I get it. I want that at home. So libraries help drive demand, and, and I, I wish publishers could see that and, and even just agree on a, a common regime of licensing. It's just mm -hmm. so much extra difficulty to manage all these different things. Mm -hmm. uh, good luck on that. We have a question about, uh, you know, people that, that depend on the library for access. If the library is not open, do you do any kind of lending of tablets or... Uh, you said you, you keep your Wi-Fi on, I suppose, after hours so people can kind of come around the building a little bit. And no, actually, in, interestingly, during lockdown, uh, many libraries realized they'd have to close their Wi-Fi down because they didn't want crowds of people congregating outside the library. Because, yeah, people normally do. And, you know, that might be homeless people or um, people without, without Wi-Fi. But they, they didn't want points of gathering. Um, but during lockdown, there were libraries that were involved in schemes to lend or give tablets to, um, especially focus on disadvantaged uh, families and children, so they didn't have such an educational disadvantage, and, and also isolated elderly people. But a lot of that was quite small scale. So one charity that libraries work with, um, they distributed about 2,000 tablets, but that's against a background of nearly 2 million people who are without home connectivity. So it's a drop in the ocean. So I think what, what I'm just starting to think through and talk to people is how can libraries do something of scale? So, you know, the, the whole vision of the People's Network, whenever that was 20 years ago, was to make sure that you could walk into, wherever you lived, you could walk into your local library. There is the internet. You can get access. There's someone who will help you. Um, you know, and it's safe. There's um, certain things are blocked off. Uh, you're not going to blow up the whole system. Um, and then the next step more recently was to make sure all libraries had Wi-Fi access so residents can also now bring their own devices and hang out in the library and, and benefit from that. 
So I think it's the, the next wave, isn't it? Thinking how do you then take those, um, take the internet outside the bricks and mortar into people's houses. Um, and I think there's a whole growing debate in this country about data poverty um, and, and how that's become a very real and painful issue during lockdown. Now, interestingly, the, the other issue that came into sharp relief was, was obesity. So the UK is the, I think it's the second fattest nation in Europe. So again, not a great, uh, a great issue. And, and the link of obesity to um, rates of severe illness with COVID and indeed death. Um, that was heightened because, um, as you may know, our Prime Minister um, had, you know, well, I think he nearly died from, from COVID and he recognises now that's partly because he was overweight. So he's now developed an obesity strategy. So I kind of think, all right, if the government can commit to a strategy to tackle something as complex as obesity, which, you know, needs multi-agency, multi-department activity, will need sustained attention over years and years, um, then, you know, tackling digital inclusion is an equally complex problem. But surely, if we can have a strategy for obesity, surely we can have a, a government strategy for digital inclusion. Um, surely. And, you know, surely libraries um, at, at fairly low cost of investment could, could make quite an important yeah. role within that strategy. We've seen images of the prime minister jogging. So uh, that's, that's shocking to us imagining that such a thing in our own country is unimaginable. Uh, but, you know, go for it. Uh, and it's a great comparison, the complexity level of dealing with uh, that and, you know, that, that type of health uh, issue uh, mm -hmm. and, and connectivity for everybody. Our, our position that we've been talking about in the series is, is more library access points in the community and uh, not as an answer, but as an interim or as a backup. I mean, even if you have a connection, you can lose it somehow and then you have another place to go. So some combination of a public phone, an emergency call box and a library access point. It should be one in every neighborhood within walking distance. And just people have to be careful, uh, you know, like they do anyway. So it shouldn't be your responsibility to to, for people to be distanced when they're being advised to do it anyway. But terrific report, there's a lot of detail there. I think a lot of people will be looking and replaying this. This presentation, Isabel, is excellent. Thank you so much for coming. Um, and we will maybe come back and have a more open discussion at the end, but we need to move on now to, to Castleberry ISD. And we'll let Heather, or Jacob, either one, uh, lead us into their story. Okay, I think Jacob is I going saw to. Him. I did too. Okay. I'm getting ready here. Oh, there he is. Yep. He's gonna he's gonna share the slides and drive. Please introduce yourselves again, uh, so that everybody will have an idea of who it is. All right, well, my name is Jacob Bowser. I'm the uh, Director of Technology Operations for Castleberry ISD in Fort Worth, Texas. Um, and uh, with me is Heather Lamb. She's our lead librarian, um, and she is kind of uh, gonna be heading up our presentation today to uh, tell you about the uh, programs that we have going on here in Castleberry ISD. Yes, and welcome, and yeah, I'm very excited. And uh, Jacob's gonna start off telling you about our wonderful, um, I call it, um, it's, it provides possibilities for us. Um, and, you know, libraries are, um, they're near and dear to my heart. And I loved um, Isabel's stories and I wrote lots of notes. So, um, and it, I think that what our story is, is, is a great piggyback to what um, they're doing in the UK. So Jacob, why don't you tell them um, about Castleberry? Just to confirm, can you all see a uh, slide with a map in the background? We can. Okay, perfect. Um, so Castleberry ISD is a relatively small school district in North Texas. If you're familiar with uh, the North Texas area, we're in the uh, Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex, um, kind of centered right in the middle of Fort Worth, but um, we are our own independent school district um, that spans across three different municipalities. Uh, we have seven schools. Uh, three elementary schools, a middle school, a high school, and two alternative schools. Uh, we're about seven square miles. Um, 
and uh, our enrollment right now is about 3608. Uh, we're hoping that's going to go up a little bit before the beginning of the school year. Um, we're 86 percent economically disadvantaged, meaning that um, our students come from backgrounds that um, don't necessarily have the benefit of, um, you know, disposable funds, and um, they're more focused on housing and food and you know shelter and everything like that, and they're not able to uh, dedicate those funds to connectivity. Um, whenever we polled our students in 2017. 36% uh, of them said that they didn't, absolutely did not have access to Wi-Fi at home. 21% uh, said that they had limited access to Wi-Fi. And um, after asking a few more questions and, you know, deeper questions, we figured that um, by limited access, they meant that they were using their parents' cell phones as hotspots inside the home. And then 9% said that they were unsure if they had Wi-Fi at home, which was uh, they likely didn't, and uh, if they did, it was almost certainly through their, their parents' cell phone. Um, so that's kind of an overview of our demographics and our location. So why does connectivity matter to us? Um, I have a big, long timeline here that uh, I'm not going to bore you by uh, reading all the, the bullets here, but um, from 2010 to 2020, over the course of 10 years, we have... Uh, provided one-to-one -one computing devices to our students, whether it's an iPad or uh, a different type of tablet, uh, a laptop, computer, Chromebook. Um, every single student at this point, and, and especially since COVID-19, um, every single one of our students has a device that they take home with them. Um, but they did not have the connectivity to support those devices. Um, so we were kind of in a tough spot because we were trying to um, use innovative teaching practices, um, flipped lessons, uh, project-based learning, um, you know, things that wouldn't be possible if the students don't have connectivity at home. Uh, so we started our search. We started basically an initiative to find a way to provide connectivity to our students' homes without, you know, breaking the law, without uh, the FCC police coming, uh, breaking down our doors. Uh, so, we, um, you know, we evaluated four or five different types of technology to um, provide connectivity to our students' homes. Uh, and over the course of about a year of research and lots of rubrics and meetings and all sorts of things, we decided to go with the private LTE solution, um, meaning that we would have to construct our own uh, LTE towers and have antennas and radios up on towers broadcasting that signal out to our students' homes. Um, luckily, being such a small school district, that was feasible for us. Um, larger school districts, maybe not so much, um, but there are also ways that you could do it with uh, different types of technology. Uh, but like I said, we went with a private LTE solution, um, and uh, you know, it's taken us about three years. We're three years into the project, and we stood up the last tower and provisioned the network on it um, about a month before COVID-19 struck here in North Texas. So it was a, a pretty timely project, and I'm thankful for that. But um, just to give you a little bit more insights into it, or you know what it looks like in the real world, uh, this is one of our towers. We have 150-foot monopole uh, towers, and uh, we have three LTE sectors per tower, meaning that we have three radios and three antennas at the top of each one of these towers. Here's a, a close-up image of one of those um, radio antenna combos. You can see the scale of it. And there's the assembly right there. So just, and I don't want to get too technical. This is, um, I'm sure a lot of you would be interested in seeing it, uh, but uh, this is just like a 10,000 foot overview of uh, how the network is set up for us. Uh, we have the, like I said, three 150-foot monocle towers with a little control box down at the base of it. Uh, it connects back to our school's network. Um, unfortunately, right now, we are not allowed to use uh, E-rate funded fiber to do that, but uh, I'm hoping that's going to change with uh, some legislature that's out there right now. Um, but um, yeah, it connects back to our school network, uh, totally isolated from typical school traffic. Uh, it goes out through a content filter to the internet. So 
every device that connects to one of these LTE towers is filtered and uh, it's safe and secure. Uh, and then in the students' homes, they have um, little black boxes that we like to call Wi-Fi routers because it's simpler. Uh, but that connects back to our LTE towers and it provides connectivity inside the home. So there's a Wi-Fi signal that's broadcast inside the home uh, that the students can connect to with their Chromebooks and iPads and whatnot. And so that's an overview of the technical side of things of how the network actually operates. But I think what's important for the conversation today is to see what we're doing with it. What's um, you know, what benefits we're getting out of it. Of course, the benefit during lockdown was, of course, remote learning. Uh, but past COVID-19, if, if we can ever get past this, uh, what sort of benefits are we going to see in the future? How is this going to enhance teaching and learning? How is it going to allow us to get out into the community and provide library services or, um, you know, anything else that this technology would allow us to do. So I think uh, Heather's going to take over from here and uh, kind of show what she's been able to do with our system and our private LTE network. And then we'll uh, probably circle back around. And if you have any questions about more technical items, I'm happy to help. So there are, Jacob, there are a few questions. Do you want to answer them now or at the end? Um, yeah, let me take a look. There's it's there's one about speed and then funding, mm -hmm. and and then there's one about can other kids um, can families use other devices. Gotcha. Um, so funding, unfortunately, there was no funding source aside from our local uh, fund balance. So um, it was entirely locally funded by our school district here because at the time when we started this three years ago. Um, this wasn't even a glimmer in um, USAC's eye. E-rate was not even considering uh, any projects like this. If we were to submit it, they would just hit delete on the email. So um, certainly not E-rate funded and there were no grants available that I could find. And we did quite a bit of searching for it. So um, entirely funded by us. What, uh, what, so up, excuse me, what, what was the total cost over the three years? Over the three years, it's, it was about six hundred thousand dollars for all of the special construction, and um, and the ongoing cost for that is about eighty thousand dollars a year. So, uh, much much less than if we were just buying hotspots from an AT and T or T Mobile. Yeah, and it reaches everyone in the district. It, it reaches just about everyone. Uh, that's my next hurdle. There on the outskirts of our district, there are a few small spots that don't get. Um, the ideal amount of coverage. So it's technically still usable, but they may have to have like an antenna outside of their home, which is not, not ideal for us. But um, that, like I said, that's the next hurdle that I'm trying to get over. Um, and speeds? Speed. Um, so in an ideal situation, uh, very close to the tower, uh, you can get 60 to 70 megabit per second, which is, um, you know, pretty typical broadband speed for this area. Uh, we don't have any carriers that have fiber directly to the home or anything of that nature. So uh, typical cable internet speeds. And as you get further away from the uh, antenna uh, combo, the antenna um, radio combo, it's, uh, you know, it gets slower and slower. So at the very, very outskirts of our district, uh, you can expect to see, you know, 20 to 25 megabit per second. Um, inside and this is home. LTE in, uh, in the CBRS? It is technically in the bands that CBRS also occupies, but um, the, we're on band 43 right now, whereas CBRS is band 48. Um, but uh, this summer, since our technology is so similar, uh, this summer we're just going to transition over uh, to band 48 CBRS. So uh, there will be no, um, no large change in the coverage area or the uh, capabilities. If anything, it's going to allow us to use more modern technologies and uh, kind of uh, boost the speed uh, of the connectivity in our students' homes because we can utilize technologies like carrier aggregation and um, you know things of that nature to uh, to enhance the speed. And that's uh, firmware. Are you going to have to replace radios or? We're going to have to replace some equipment. Uh, we're still in talks with radio manufacturers to see what we can continue using and what's going to need to be re to uh, to need need to be replaced um, in the, uh, the system that we currently have. So I'm hoping the equipment cost is going to be minimal. 
Um, but, uh, you know, that's still kind of up in the air right now. Okay. We can continue operating on band 48 or sorry, band 43, which is our, our current band until October. Um, but the FCC has made a hard deadline for October saying that, um, if you're operating on band 43, uh, you need to, you know, discontinue your operation until you can, uh, transition over to band 48. So, uh, that's uh, another uh, kind of hurdle that we're we're trying to get past this summer. Great. We'll cir probably circle back with some more questions. Uh, sorry to interrupt. Please, Heather, go ahead. Okay. Well, um, it's. I think I don't know what all those letters and things mean, but it's super challenge. I mean, super exciting because what it does do is um, it um, allows us as librarians um, to. It's all the possibilities because. Um, when we started, when we, we like to get out in the community, but then we're limited, um, before COVID hit, um, we were thinking about different things, uh, what we could do. And I presented an opportunity to our associate superintendent, um, at a conference and it was a bus. And this was, like I said, pre COVID. Um, and if, Jacob, if you want to go to the next slide, um, and the reason is, is because this is River Oaks. This is River Oaks, Texas. This is where we live um, and our kids live. And it's because of this. Um, we're in a book desert. And what a book desert is, it's a geographic area where our kids, they don't have the printed, they don't have printed books. Um, if you look at this chart, it's linked and we'll share this presentation. But uh, what this means, what this legend means, and you can see where River Oaks, Texas is, they have less than they're in that bot that not the bottom but it's estimated percentage of homes with uh more or than 100 but we're at the very the next less than 10 to 20 per hundred books so we're low um that's linked uh, in there but um but they don't have books in their they don't have books in their home so we had a challenge how do we get books into our into our community, we have a very small public library that's open three, I think three days a week, and they're not open on the weekends. So that's a challenge for us um, as school librarians. Um, and so, and many of our families only have one car, and it's, um, and so then, and the car goes usually with the father, so then they're limited. Um, so that's, that was a big why for us. So go to the next slide, Jacob. So after, Seeing this, we also know that um, based on this ALA um, document that they don't have connectivity, but we know that um, strong school libraries bridge that gap. So we decided, my the librarians, we all have, they're certified librarians at all of our campuses. We put our thinking caps on and said, hey, what if we connect with um, start looking about a bus and I had seen bookmobiles at the public libraries and said why can't we do this and just so happened at a conference there was a bookmobile so I uh, we decided um, could we do this um, so can we go to the next slide and that was the first stage of what we decided this was our books and bites um, idea and it was the first idea of what if we had a bus what would what would our mission be and this bu particular bus that we got on was they had partnered with our child nutrition department and so we started brainstorming and thinking if we could partner with our own child nutrition department because we don't have the monies and just like jacob had said um the funding so we just we started talking and brainstorming and one of our missions with our program books and bites is to provide a healthy breakfast and lunch during the summer. So by partnering with our child nutrition department, that helped with some of our funding. Our tools and resources, we know early literacy skills are important. We wanna prepare our students for lifelong learning. The, life, um, the literature, we have a big coding initiative in our district. And then access, that big thing about access. So those are our mission and, next slide, Jacob. And so here's Mo. So this is Mo, and so because we know that we want to go where the people are. So Mo, so the history of Mo, um, the R, we partnered with, we started out the conversation with our child nutrition department, and they were like all on board. 
our transportation department said, oh yeah, we have a bus. And after conversations, one conversation led me and I said, is that bus, the bus that's been parked down the street that hasn't moved for a year? And they said, yes. So the bus that we thought was a bus that they were gonna just take off the bus barn actually was not a bus that it, it, they were taking parts off it. But they put the parts back on, we worked with someone and we got him wrapped and we named, we gave him a persona because um, we just decided that was the thing to do. And rather than try to break any things, we, Mo stands, if you look at the website, um, it's, you know, uh, if you're familiar with um, Don't Let the Pigeon Drive the Bus and Mo Willems, that's kind of the behind the scenes of Mo. But everyone in the city um, knows Mo. Everybody in the district knows Mo. The kids know Mo. So the unique thing is, is that Mo goes into the community. Mo provides Wi-Fi access. One of those routers that J Jacob talked about went on the bus. So we are providing that access. Um, we are completely funded by donations, district services, but as far as somebody opening up in the district with big pockets of dollars, it's usually me calling and saying, we need books um, donated, can you help us? Go to the next slide, Jacob, please. Um, in previous years, this was what our schedule was. We had three days a week, we had volunteers, we provided breakfast and lunch. We wanted our parents to be involved so we, are, we invited our parents in. So it's just like the inside out, we provided, and we had stops and there were stops where we connected. So we had all those connections and the stops weren't just a 30 minute stop, they were longer stops because we were trying to promote the literacy. And we knew that our libraries were closed so much that we kind of were an extension. Did we partner with our library, our public library? Absolutely, so they, they um, would promote our program. So it was a handshake, um, but we provided access. We had lots of books and smiles and fun, but then COVID hit. So next slide. Oh, we did also have community pop-ups. So we didn't just do it in the summer. We also said, okay, we need to do something throughout the year. So we did provide community pop-ups. Um, so we extended um, most through the year. This was one of our flyers, so you could see that these were all of our different stops throughout the, we went, what we discovered was after the first year, we needed to go more into the community um, versus them coming to us. We had to come to them. So we, we went further into the community um, and found stops that um, were more into the community. And then COVID hit and we said, oh gosh, we, I don't want to, not, I presented to my library team and said, you know, we have, um, we can't, well, first of all, my director, well, the associate superintendent said, I don't think Mo's going to run this summer. I just, we, I don't think it's, it's not going to be safe. And then I said, can we rethink the possibilities? And she said, you can rethink anything. So, um, uh, and so, but she said, but Mo can't run. So, um, and then I said, to my team, what, what do you think? And so we came up with this and um, I reached out to the community and I mean, I reached out to my, well, I did reach out to the community and to the child nutrition. And I said, what is your summer gonna look like? And my, the child nutrition said, we're going to be serving food on these days. And I said, okay. And I said, okay, so if we can't, if we don't want to have people like normally they go through the bins and I said okay that can't happen so what's the next best thing so we created book bags that were age appropriate book bags and so we usually we had book bins that were separated so we just made book bags that were separated by grade level and then we had those um the the parents, when they picked up their food, they just carried over and we said, what grade are you in? And we just handed a book bag full of books. And then we, we said, okay, wait a minute. We usually have activities. So what are we going to do? So we had all these supplies and we packed up supplies and each week we had a theme. So each week we decided we would have a theme and each week there was one week was friendship. One week was camp, I think camping. So we created, if you'll go to the next, um, I think the next slide, Jacob. 
oh, this is just some of us handing out the food. New child, child nutrition ladies got into ha the ha they were handing out book bags. So we created one of these pages. Oh, you can go to the next page. Um, the the child nutrition ladies helped us, but we made one of these little interactive pages for each week. So each week had a theme, but there was a read aloud for them that we gave them all the supplies that they could do, whatever they wanted to do with it. They didn't have to do it, but, but we know our community, they didn't have to go out to get glue or scissors. We gave them that in the bag. They had everything and then we wanted them to share it. And so this was Addison and on, we had a Padlet and we said, share this. Um, and so they shared, um, so she, she shared her activity. So we gave, we just took all our supplies and put them in the baggie. And then they had everything because we just know our community doesn't, they don't have that stuff. We, you pull your community, you know your community. And what we did is we removed the barriers is what we did. And, and we built, we're, you know, we have all that we have, we still have the eBooks and we have all that. But what we, what we felt like we were, when you have the eBooks, when you have all those things, it's still, there's a barrier there. So even by, by presenting, we were out there with the community, even with the six foot distance, we were smiling and we were saying, Hey, here's this. And we still love you. And, and we still, we miss you. And, um, here is these, um, here's, here's what we want. And we know reading is important. We know. And, and then we said, when you're done reading the, with the books, pay it forward and share these books with friends. So, all right, go to the next, you can go to the next slide. And then we're always perfecting and we're always looking. So this is the inside of Mo. So I'm always asking, I'm never afraid of asking anything. So, um, if you're wondering the outside, what the outside of Mo looks like, Mo is all wrapped. And so um, it was seats. And so I always ask her, you know, what can I get? So um, a friend of a friend um, was looking for his Eagle Scout project, and this became his Eagle Scout project. So I'm, you know, if I can get something for nothing, then I'm going to look for it. So his Eagle Scout project um, became the inside of Mo. So um, he's very proud. And that was, um, you know, it will be ready whenever, whenever we're ready to bring Mo back out. What we're thinking is, if you'll go to the next slide is what's next for Mo is we're going to have virtual pop ins. So um, we're thinking about possibly creating um, books and bites little little libraries. So we've been kind of thinking about how can we create um, the, the um, little little free libraries around and, and put bags of books around our community. Um, so, you know, just kind of surprise packs and we're going to continue our grab and go drive through service and just continue connecting with our community and that bringing the inside out. We're going to be closed remote. Um, our our library is going to be remote, but we're going to pro provide concierge services. But um, but Mo is an important part of our library program, and it's important uh, an important part of our community. So we're really proud of him, and it's really because of um, the the Wi-Fi is an, an important part of what we can do. And if we can take Mo into the community more, I'm thinking about the virtual pop-in. Is if we can take Mo, not kids get on the bus, but maybe that's another access point um, that we can take Mo in and and connect with the community even more. So, um, and thankful for Jacob and his, um, the, the brains behind all of that, that allows us that access. Very cool. Uh, Heather, uh, connecting uh, reading with food is brilliant. Uh, talk about positive reinforcement. Um, Let's see, everybody's giving you great reviews here. We have some questions on availability to slideshow or, mm -hmm. or are, if you two are willing to share your emails in the chat, anybody that might want to contact you, I don't want to send that out to everybody, but if you would put your emails there in the chat, then people can ask directly uh, for a copy of the slides. It's, that's just Absolutely. wonderful. Absolutely. 
Uh, yeah, and I, I, I think I saw someone ask about the, I'll share anything and uh, the activities. The activities are all on our website, but, and the flyers and stuff. Um, yeah, we can collect, we can get the emails. And I didn't know about the bookmobile organization, but. Um, right. I, and I, I didn't mean, know about the grant either. So is okay. there a way to capture the chat? Yes, yes, we do capture the chat and uh, we'll send out a, a follow-up report a uh, few days, uh, you know, first of next week, and we'll include these, uh, these links, not the emails, but the URLs for different uh, uh, resources. So that'll be good. I see you're keeping your, uh, your bouncing ball there, Heather, for your yes. for your <laughs> Yes. Working on that I thought, core. <laughs> I thought it was your bouncy personality at first, but well, just, Jacob would uh, Jacob would say that it's my bouncing personality probably as well. I but. think they're both bouncing, but <laughs> it's great. Um, we're right on the hour here. We'll go over a little bit um, for, to catch any questions. I did. I was. Uh, uh, chastised for not giving proper credit. Uh, sometimes we take some liberties with intellectual property, uh, quotes and images uh, like the one I used from The Economist, uh, not being a commercial enterprise we feel comfortable with borrowing here. Uh, but I didn't give credit to our, uh, our uh, uh, former president, uh, George Bush, for the quote on, is our children learning? And he deserves credit for that. So uh, with that attribution, uh, other questions anyone has uh, for Jacob or Heather or Isabel? Now is a good time. Uh, okay. Fort Worth, yes. Actually, I grew up in Fort Worth on the other side of town, the east side of town, but I know uh, Riverside well. Uh, been a while, um, but you know. Uh, uh, Don? Yeah. Uh I posed a couple of quick ones in the chat, and I guess my general question is, um, it, it, it looks to me like the project really benefits from the focus on being for the students, and sort of, it's a managed, sort of extending a managed network out to the community, right? That's, fil and I thought I heard Jacob say it is filtered service, so it's designed for students. And I, so my question is, how do non-students relate to that? I mean, are parents going, "Hey, how come I can't, uh, how come I can't order something online here?" You know, that kind of thing. What are, What do the edges of that look like? Right. Uh, so right now, it's actually only it's a private LTE network only utilized by students. So um, we, <laughs> and it's kind of a complicated situation with it being run across a portion of our network. Uh, there are some limitations um, put in place by the state government and the uh, federal government about uh, filtering and how we have to uh, provide the access to our students, as well as limitations put forth by, um, by E-rate. So what, uh, what we're doing right now is we're only allowing students to use it, so it hasn't been an issue with um, the public or with parents saying, hey, I can't access this or I can't access that. Uh, we do get uh, requests and complaints from students that they can't access things, but uh, that's just kind of uh, par for the course in education. Um, but yeah, I'm hopeful that uh, with the, um, you know, legislature that's out there or the pr proposed legislation that's out there, uh, if it gets passed, we might be able to extend this out to the community and allow, you know, other entities to use it, whether it's the public library or if it's the, the municipalities themselves may be able to utilize it for, you know, police cars and, you know, things of that nature. But um, the goal was not necessarily for a publicly accessible network. It's just a network for our students to extend learning uh, to the homes. And you're more likely to uh, qualify under a liberalized E-rate regime if you're just providing it for students. Mm -hmm. So certainly it's relevant to provide access to student uh, families, parents who are trying to support their, uh, their students and they need uh, access to, to uh, uh, you know, materials themselves. Especially now that uh, we're doing remote learning, the, the parents are taking the place in many ways of the teacher. So it would make sense to be able to do that. It's just 
our hands have been traditionally our hands have been tied but yep. uh, again i'm hoping with uh, the way that we're moving forward and we'll be able to uh, allow others to access those networks i think you're on the right track and uh Sean is on. Sean leads the Spectrum Group for the Schools, Health, and Libraries Broadband Coalition, an advocacy group in D.C. that's working on this very issue. I think I saw John Windhausen earlier, who's the executive director of Shelby, shlb.org, for anybody that's interested. Uh, the, uh, the, it's a way to uh, introduce your voice and your opinion directly into the conversation in D.C., where Shelby is in the thick of it, and also hear what's going on, the latest developments and so forth. So uh, the memberships are exceedingly low for anchor institutions, $250, $500 a year uh, to, uh, to have a voice in DC. I highly recommend checking it out. Sean's just put the, uh, the URL up there. Uh, but I think you're really on the right track there, Jacob, with your, with your architecture and your, and your business model. Um, Anything else for anyone? We're running over here. I would like to close it out. We'll hang around as we usually do for a while for open conversation. But for the record, anybody else? Isabel, uh, last word? Maybe we lost Isabel to happy hour. I'm sorry. I'm oh, I'm oh, there she is. <laughs> Thank you. It's okay. been really, really fascinating to hear, um, hear from Heather and Jacob. Re really, really interesting. and and. I just love the determination to get out and support your communities, whatever the challenge or the constraints you're getting out there. So, uh, yeah, really I inspiring agree. stuff. Thank I, you. I completely agree. And, and it, it makes me think of uh, Eric Kleinenberg's uh, kind of admonition to, you know, his is, is all been about the architecture, you know, the building and things you can do inside of it. And now we have to, as uh, Heather was saying and Jake was saying, inside out. So what is a library is inside out. So it's out in the community delivering services and creating an environment for learning and information and services. So there are different ways to do that. And we've seen a couple of really uh, interesting ones. So thank you very much again, Isabel and Heather and Jacob. Uh, with that, I think we'll close the formal recording. Uh, but before we do, I'd like to ask everybody to unmute, if you could. Distance and wear unmute. masks. And then everybody unmute. Joss family is going to a barbecue afterward. And unmute we've been everybody. Yeah, I, I mean, we've been I'd like to thank our guests and, and give everybody a, a round of applause, please. Yep, here we go. Thank you. Thank you. All right, thank you. Come back next week. <laughs>